Great, thanks. Um, great to see so many people here interested in this topic. Uh, before I get started, I want to just uh, acknowledge that Stacy and Brian and Steve have done a great job pulling this together, um, not just this event, but, but all of the events that they're going to be offering this um, semester. Uh, tremendous resource that it's great to see you taking advantage of it, and hopefully you'll continue to do so. So my name is Jonas Monis. I spend part of my time here across the street at the law school. Uh, teach energy law, teach natural resources law, um, do other energy related activities over there. And then I spend the other part of my time across campus at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions where um, we interpret our role as being a bridge between Duke and all that Duke has to offer to uh, for answering big environmental policy questions with the people in the real world in the seats of government and in business who are actually struggling with those environmental policy questions. So we try to make sure that we understand what the questions are. Um, we come back here to Duke, take advantage of um, all of the uh, good research that exists and also the ability to help answer those questions, both from the economic side, from the legal side, um, from the scientific side. Um, and few challenges are more complex than uh, figuring out how to manage a, uh, an electricity sector that is in a period of very rapid transition for a lot of reasons, including environmental reasons, but not solely environmental reasons, um, how to manage that in a way uh, that you achieve the goals that Dahlia closed with, which is uh, affordable, reliable, and clean electricity. And by the way, I love going after Dahlia because she always covers so much information in her 20 minutes, I don't have to do as much. Um, <clears throat> so I'm talking about the role of environmental policy in a transitioning electricity sector, right? So this is my clip art, silos. Um, from a regulatory perspective, we treat energy under one set of statutes and uh, uh, you know, as a result under a certain set of government agencies at the federal level and at the state level. Department of Energy, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Department of Interior, state governments, public utility commissions that Dolly mentioned. And then we treat environmental issues, public health impacts, environmental impacts under a separate set of statutes that leads to a separate um, uh, regulatory system uh, focused on those particular problems, right? And actually there was an event here a number of years ago where the administrator of the EPA, um, now the current administrator of the EPA, she was, she was the um, assistant administrator at the time, Gina McCarthy was here and she was talking to a state utility commissioner um, whose name was Ron Benz who had been nominated to uh, uh, serve on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. That, that nomination didn't make it through the Senate. But they were talking to one another, and one of the points that I thought was really interesting was they, they both said, we don't speak the other person's language, right? Um, so, so from the State Utility Commission, typically interpret their mandate as least cost power. If they are regulating a monopoly, right, like here in Duke Energy, or here in North Carolina, we have Duke Energy, where Duke Energy owns power plants, Duke Energy owns transmission lines, distribution lines, and Duke Energy um, has an exclusive service territory where they're the only seller of electricity within that territory. Um, the Public Utility Commission provides the check on the prices that Duke Energy, the, the regulated monopoly, is able to charge. That's the language that Ron Benz spoke. Um, uh, now Administrator McCarthy spoke a language of public health impacts. Now, if you take a look at this from the perspective of an electric utility deciding uh, you know, what to build, if you're going to build something, this is a, a chart that I've put together, those of you in energy law, uh, we scribbled this on the board, so it should look somewhat familiar. I admit that it's, it's very um, imperfect, but the point here um, is to highlight all of the different factors that go into deciding uh, whether a utility needs to build a new power plant, and if so, what type of, new, what type of power plant that utility may need to build, right? Um, available financing, is there electricity demand? Is, uh, is, is demand growth gonna justify building something at all? If you're gonna build something, what are the fuel price projections? That influences what you're gonna build probably Today, you'd be building a natural gas facility. What's the existing infrastructure? Do you also have to think about how do you get the fuel to you and how do you get the electricity to where you need it? Are there mandates for renewable energy, energy efficiency, that sort of thing? Um, environmental laws, some environmental laws come from the federal government. Some environmental laws come from the state government. Sometimes the federal government says, state government, you have a role here to play. So, um, but it all translates into environmental regulations that the utility has to think about. And then the utility commission, state utility regulation, um, taking all that into account to try to figure out what low cost power means, what types of investments are appropriate for a monopoly to make um, in order to make sure that it is providing affordable and reliable power. And because environmental regulations <coughs> say clean is also important, clean as well. 
<coughs> so those silos break down when you, when you get down to practical decision making. So taking it, zooming back out, looking at environmental regulation. So the power sector uh, is the source of a large number of, of uh, air pollutants in this country. So it's not surprising that environmental regulations would be targeting uh, the power sector. Right? So we just had, uh, there's a uh, mercury rule uh, utility mats, um, mercury and air toxic standards for electric utilities um, was just going into effect. The Supreme Court, uh, with a decision this summer, put a little wrinkle there. It's still going to go into effect, but the EPA has some more process to go through before the rule is finalized. But anyway, you can see some of these um, uh, emissions that from, have public health impacts, therefore environmental regulations affected. I borrowed this slide. This is a few years old now. I borrowed this slide from the National Mining Association. Right, so the National Mining Association, 2009, 2010, right, so President Obama has come in, and Assistant Administrator McCarthy is running the AIR program. Um, the way that we treat these, these particular pollutants under the Clean Air Act, we treat them as different rulemaking processes. So there's a rule for dealing with nitrous oxides. There's a rule for, a number of rules for dealing with sulfur dioxide. Rule for dealing with ozone, particulate matter, mercury. There's also a separate set of pollutants that now is being regulated under the Clean Air Act that prior to 2009 had not been regulated under the Clean Air Act, which is greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So the um, uh, National Mining Association <coughs> was worried that this is going to, together, this is going to result in reduced demand for coal. So what you have here is you have trains that, judging from the amount of smoke coming out of the smokestacks, probably burning coal, knowing what we know about the rail industry and the economics there, probably transporting coal. Um, but these, these rail lines are uh, uh, getting ready to run right into each other, and it's going to be a disaster for the electricity sector, and there's, we're not going to have reliable electricity anymore. So far, that hasn't happened. Um, this was kind of a worst case scenario. But it certainly had a, a large political impact, including um, even a, a bill that was introduced in Congress called the train wreck bill to try to stop some of these. If, you ever, if you're going to work in, on Capitol Hill, by the way, and you want to get some attention for your piece of legislation you're proposing, come up with a good acronym like train wreck. People pay attention to it. People like me still talk about it years later. Um, so <clears throat> what happens? Coal-fired power plants are shutting down. Environmental regulations are playing a role in, in affecting that decision making for utilities to shut down older coal-fired power plants. Um, uh, and replace it with other types of generation. What else is taking place in the period of, say, 2009, 2010, 2011 that could also be affecting this? Natural gas prices. So natural gas prices dropping through the floor, right, because of the hydraulic fracturing and directional drilling. What else is taking place? The economy tanked, right? So we're, we're using less electricity in general. So there are a number of factors that played into this, but the reason that you see this spike from the um, annual energy uh, uh, outlook, um, the spike in 2012, or sorry, 2016, this is when the mercury rule went into effect, right? And unlike some of those other regulations, when you're, when, uh, you're talking about mercury or other hazardous air pollutants, the Clean Air Act is very prescriptive, right? Which means it, it's very specific about how much time uh, the, the covered entities here, the power sector, coal-fired power plants, had to comply. So three years with the potential for a one-year extension which is a relatively quick planning process in the electricity sector. And it's also very prescriptive about what you have to do, um, as opposed to some of the other pollutants that I listed up there where there's more flexibility in the statute. So this, this date mattered. And you you know, from this date forward, utilities were planning as though they, if a coal-fired power plant is going to be running after 2016, it either is going to have um, technologies on it to reduce the amount of mercury coming out of the smokestack, or they're going to shut it down and they're going to be running something else. Right? And both of those decisions, once you make it, are irreversible. You've now either put something, a, a new piece of technology, on the power plant. It's now more expensive to run because you have to pay off that piece of technology. Or you shut it down. And once you decide to shut it down, you're probably not going to reverse that decision and go back and do something else. <coughs> so we have a transitioning electricity sector. Dahlia talked about some of these factors, retiring coal generation, increasing natural gas generation. If you're a utility commissioner here in North Carolina, uh, especially in 2011, 2012, um, and you see Duke Energy proposing to build a lot more natural gas fire generation, you get nervous because natural gas prices, if you, if you worked in the commission long enough, you remember that in uh, the early 2000s, natural gas prices spiked. and spiked much higher than had been projected, right? So you may be worried that if you're relying on a fuel source 
that in the past has had volatility. Maybe in the future it's going to have volatility, maybe not. Maybe hydraulic fracturing has increased supply enough that, that we won't see that anymore. But some nervousness based on history there. So increasing solar generation, PV panels are, are cheap. Um, regulatory uncertainty, what's coming next for environmental regulations. It's certainly now clear that environmental regulations can change the economic calculation of what type power plant to run. Um, <coughs> potential nuclear retirements. Right? Our, our nuclear fleet is, is getting very old in this country, and many of them are going to reach the end of their permitted life in the early to mid-2030s. And as Dolly mentioned, it takes a long time to start planning to, to do something about that if you're going to build a new nuclear plant, especially. Uncertain demand growth, right? Our appliances are more efficient. We have the, the products that Matt Harding talked about. We may, more of us may be putting solar panels on our roofs or buying less of the product that the utility wants to sell to us. Therefore, you don't quite know what, what to build. And then CO2 regulations. <clears throat> so sample risk mitigation strategies. What do you do about this? Okay, so one thing you can do is you can delay major capital investments. You can put it off until you get a little bit more information about what's happening in the marketplace. Get a little bit more information about what the standard, what the environmental standards are going to be in regulation. Um, you can do that potentially through energy efficiency. By the way, I want to pause here. There's a really good question earlier about energy efficiency and whether um, the, the types of products that Matt is studying, um, whether that runs into the, the uh, conflicts with the business model of an electric utility. Um, the utilities don't mind investing in energy efficiency, especially if they get reimbursed for it, right? Um, and in a, in a regulated state like North Carolina, where the utility commission has a lot to say, actually has, uh, has the final word on how much Duke Energy is able to charge, if Duke Energy comes to the utility commission and says, OK, we agree energy efficiency is a good idea. We're willing to do it, but we have shareholders and we need to have a, you know, they need to get a return on investment. So if we invest money in energy efficiency, we want to also make a return on investment on that, just like if we had invested in steel and concrete. Well, the utility commission says, OK, we agree with you. That may be a good idea. But if we're going to let you charge consumers, we have to feel certain that the consumers are actually getting a benefit. And that's a really hard thing to prove with energy efficiency because Maybe the consumer is buying less electricity because the energy efficiency program is really effective. Maybe the consumer is buying less electricity because the economy tanked. And if the economy tanked, Duke Energy shouldn't be charging consumers for it. Right? This is part of the rationale for the utility commission. So the types of products now that, that provide clear data about what's happening and whether energy efficiency actually is um, having a, an impact on the amount that consumers are buying, that, that provides a feedback loop that utility commission then can say, OK, there is a value here. Duke Energy, you can charge consumers for it. It's more complicated than that, but, but this new data um, does change that calculation some. Other risk mitigation strategies. Renewable generation, right? So it's, it can take a lot to build a wind farm. Once you have it up and running, you don't have a fuel cost. So if you're worried about fuel cost volatility, then you may be mitigating some of that. It also doesn't emit. Um, uh, sulfur dioxide, for example, doesn't emit carbon dioxide. So if you're worried about those types of issues going forward, you may uh, seriously consider renewable generation, other types of new technologies. Uh, nuclear, very, very expensive. There are some new nuclear units being built right now, but um, uh, very few because it's expensive to build. Um, another risk mitigation strategy, if you're worried about some of these things, that you keep is you increase the amount that you're using your existing coal-fired power plant for, unless the risk you're trying to mitigate is CO2 rigs. <clears throat> All right, greenhouse gas reduction strategies. Some of these strategies look the same for reducing greenhouse gas emissions as they do as, as the, the previous list um, of, of reducing electricity sector risk. So if you put these side by side, then you start seeing where this overlap is. Right? And August of this year, so just about a month ago, um, the EPA changed the calculation about whether utilities should be worried about greenhouse gas emissions or not by releasing two rules. One rule dealing with greenhouse gas emissions from new power plants, which we don't build a whole lot of new power plants in this country, and another rule dealing with greenhouse gas emissions from existing power plants, and we have a lot of them. That matters. Right? It, in some ways, it is similar to the conversation in 2007, 2008, 2009 when it seemed like Congress may pass a bill to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Where from the utility side, the conversation may be, well, we, we don't like this. We wish they weren't doing it. But if we have to do it, let's figure it out. 
Um, and then in 2010, when the congressional debate kind of fell apart, um, then it got back to the question was, should we regulate greenhouse gas emissions, not how should we regulate greenhouse gas emissions? Well, now the EPA, using its existing authority under the Clean Air Act, which was written quite some time ago before greenhouse gas emissions were front and center in Congress's mind, um, now it's changed the calculation. Now we do have a national policy to limit greenhouse gas emissions in the power sector. It will be challenging court. Maybe it survives, maybe it doesn't. But for the moment, it's in place. That means utilities, once again, are approaching this as if we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, what do we do? And regulators, we, at the Nicholas Institute, we spend a lot of our time with state regulators around this very question of how do you deal with the clean power plan, which is the, the rule for dealing with CO2 emissions from existing power plants. Incredibly complex, but when you close the door and you remove that you don't have the, the media in the room and you get past some of the politics and it turns into a pragmatic conversation about choices that the electricity sector is facing anyway because it's in a period of transition and this is a new layer of concerns that the utility sector has to pay attention to reducing greenhouse gas emissions what do you do so the clean power plant let's take a couple of minutes on this clean power plan is um, issued under the clean air act which means the epa is pursuing some strategies that it probably wouldn't have done if, this, if Congress had passed a bill and they had started from scratch. Okay, so, this, so the EPA is working under a section of the statute that was written in 1970 and is largely the same today as it was in, in 1970. Um, in this, this section of the act, it's uh, got a, a role for the federal government, a role for state governments, which is called cooperative federalism, which is pretty consistent or pretty common in environmental <coughs> um, statutes. But here, the EPA has set a target for every single state based on the existing fleet of coal-fired power plants and natural gas-fired power plants when in each state, the EPA has set a target, has set a number, an emissions limit for that state. So because the electricity sector looks different in each state, um, uh, the state, state targets differ. And then the EPA has said, okay, here's your number. States, you have a lot of choices here. You can figure it out yourself. You can adopt the model rule that we, the EPA, are kind enough to provide to you. Um, you can do a combination, right? You can uh, expect your, you, your electric generating units so your power plants to reduce emissions themselves. You can take into account the fact that if you are building new renewable generation and you're relying less on coal and more on natural gas, and you're including, you're increasing your energy efficiency investments, that all that together would probably reduce emissions from the power sector. So the EPA is saying just because our rule is focused on coal-fired power plants and natural gas-fired power plants, you, the states, you can choose to do other things. Um, and now the states are in a position where they have to figure out what to do with that range of choices. If you're a state regulator, um, probably, if push, you would like to have choices, but if you're totally honest, your job's a lot easier if you don't, right? If the EPA says, here's what to do, do it, and then the state regulator figures, you know, goes and, and does the thing that the, the US EPA says to do. So the states have a lot of choices. Um, <clears throat> what's the state trying to do? Meet the state emissions targets, achieve cost-effective compliance, reducing administrative complexity, Um, one of the concerns that state environmental regulators have is they don't want to be deciding what the electricity sector is going to be looking like. That's not their area of expertise. They want to be the, the environmental regulator. So how can they create a rule that leaves the choices to the power sector um, so the environmental regulators are setting the general guidelines but not determining exactly what this sector is going to look like going forward? Then, of course, there are a lot of political barriers. I don't think we need to um, spend time on that. So the clean power plan, you can't quite see this, but um, a target that, is, uh, that gets more stringent over time. It runs out through uh, 2030. Um, in the meantime, 2016, 2017, 2018, the states have to make all of their choices by 2018. Otherwise, the EPA makes its choices for them. I'm not going to go through this. This is, um, I know you probably can't read this, but each of those boxes is a choice that the, the state regulators have available to them. Right, so how do they answer these questions? Economic modeling, they're doing policy analysis, they're doing very intensive, some of them are doing very intensive stakeholder engagement. Because this rule, unlike other environmental 
rules like a, a, a rule to limit SO2 or a rule to limit mercury. Um, the option may, for SO2, for example, the option may be engage in, in the marketplace to buy and sell credits or buy a scrubber or buy lower sulfur coal, um, but a, a small number of choices, right? Here, with the clean power plan, this really is, is much more of an energy sector rule than an environmental rule. And it's going to have, if it goes into effect, if the courts don't throw it out, it could have a lot to say about what the electricity sector turns into by 2030. It's also creating the foundation for whatever comes next for climate policy if anything comes next. So as far as the environmental policy role in a transitioning electricity sector, wait and see. There's a, there's a, a new um, uh, big rule that just came out a month ago that, that has the potential to really change the dynamic going forward. Um, with that, I will close. A lot more to say. Happy to um, answer questions for the next 10 minutes or so. Thank you.